Give Jesus some praise in this place. No, I said give Jesus some praise in this place. Let's praise him. He's won it all for us. You know, there's nobody in the world, there's nobody in the universe that loves you more than Jesus. He was willing to go to a cross for you. He was willing to die so that you could be made free. He was willing to win the victory over death, hell, and the grave. And get this, he didn't just stop there. He gives you the victory. He won it all for you. That's love. That's a love that many people in this room tonight need to come to a new understanding of. That's a love that should shatter every preconceived notion you have about God, about what his plans are for you. But right now, we're going to get into an incredible word. My name is Mike. I'm excited to be with you guys. I'm one of the pastors here at our church. I'm excited that I get the opportunity to share with you. Go ahead and have a seat for a moment. I'm hoping you'll be back on your feet in just a minute or two. But I'm very, very excited to be with you guys tonight. I'm so glad to share this pulpit with people like Pastor Christian De La Rosa. Pastor Chris Morgan preached an amazing message last week. And of course, the one and the only Pastor Marco Garcia, our lead pastor. We are such an incredibly blessed church. How many of you know that we're blessed here, that we have some incredible leadership? We're going to be talking about a little bit about leadership today. But I'm excited because... On Wednesdays, we share a message from our daily growth book. We go into a passage, a very specific passage every week. And this week, we have a passage that I can honestly say I would never have chosen to preach a message about. I would not have said, okay, yes, this is a top 10 message. I definitely want to preach on 2 Corinthians chapter 2. No, no way. I definitely didn't want to choose this passage, but I'm excited about it because I feel like God really dropped something in my spirit for you guys, for us, for me even, in this place today. And so I'm excited as we dive in. We're going to look at a passage that covers something that is really misunderstood, something that is often a challenge, and, and actually it's a challenge that every single person in this room will face, no matter what your age, no matter how many years you've been walking on the planet, no matter how long you've been walking with God, no matter what your race, no matter your ethnicity, no matter what your educational background, this is all something that we have to deal with, and we're going to discover the right way to look at one of life's most difficult moments. And I can honestly say, myself included, just about all of us tend to mess this up pretty bad. <laughs> Almost everyone reacts poorly with this is, when this happens. It's not the loss of a loved one. I'm not talking about the death of a loved one. It's not sickness or despair. I'm not talking about a bad diagnosis. It's not a financial difficulty, not being able to pay our bills in a month. It's actually something much more difficult. Though all those things are hard, there's one thing that all of us will experience more often than any of those things, and it always causes great pain. The Bible says this always causes pain. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about correction. Ooh, I could hear the wind get sucked out of the room. So you might be like me. I personally, I hate failing. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I've been called at times a perfectionist, and I can tell you that I literally cannot stand it when I, do some, when I don't do something well. That's why I put up my golf club several years ago. I don't like to fail. I don't know why people go out on the golf course and fail like 90% of the time, and you know, no, I'm just kidding. But I don't like to fail. I hate it when I let someone down. I hate it when I hurt someone that I love. I hate it when my weaknesses or inabilities are put on display. Does anybody else hate failure in here? Okay, all right, good. I've got some honest people in there today. That's awesome. I don't know if anybody hates it quite as much as me, but if you're anything like me, we can fall into a trap when we hate failure, which it's okay. It's okay to hate failure. It's okay to hate sin or doing something wrong. But at all costs, we must avoid the trap of hating correction. We cannot hate correction. It's okay to hate failure, but do not hate correction. Look at what Proverbs 12.1 says. And I am going to jump into our daily passage. Don't worry. Proverbs 12.1 says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Wow. I love the word of God. It's so plain. <laughs> you should, you should, I mean, I, that's a word that is somewhat offensive to me. I don't, I don't know if I like being called that. So make sure you don't hate correction so you're not numbered amongst those people that might be considered fools in the Bible, right? So tonight we're going to learn how to love 
correction. I'm going to try this with you. Why don't you all say this with me? I love correction. Oh, that was actually a really good response. I love correction. You guys are awesome. So today we're going to talk about correction and we're going to hopefully at the end of this love correction even more because I'll just give you a sneak peek of my conclusion. Correction is one of the greatest love letters that God sends to us. Correction is something that conveys God's love to us like nothing else truly can. Correction is one of the ways that God demonstrates, even when others have failed you, even when your father may have failed you, your pastor may have failed you, I will never fail you because I will always make sure that I take you to a better place. You may think you're stuck here. You may think that you can't change, but I will make sure that you change. I will make sure that I correct the journey that you're on, the path that you're on, the trajectory you're on, so that you achieve a great destiny and a purpose. God's correction is something that we need to love because it leads us to a place that we've longed to be. So tonight, we're going to look at Corinthians we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, before I get into the passage, I want to sh ex give you a little context, kind of a background for those of you who maybe never heard of the book of Corinthians. What is this? What's this all about? Well, this is actually a letter from Paul to the Corinthian church. This is a church in the city of Corinth. Paul founded the Corinthian church on a missionary journey, and he actually spent quite a bit of time with the Corinthians. He actually, on his first time visiting there, spent more than a year and a half preaching, teaching, and establishing the church. But we also know that he visited them on more than one occasion after that, and, of course, he wrote them letters. He actually corresponded with them quite a bit. We actually have two of his letters in our Bibles, right? 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians are letters that Paul wrote to this church. So what about this city? What's going on in this church that Paul's writing to them about? Well, when Paul first visited the city, it already had a notorious reputation. And I think we might be able to identify with that sometimes. Uh, does San Bernardino have a good reputation? Does it have a notorious reputation? It might have a little bit of a reputation, right? And so this city was like San Bernardino in some ways in the sense that it was known for some things that weren't so great. Now, our city might be, you know, the, the, the rap, the reputation is being overturned by God's power in Jesus' name because the Wayward Outreach is here meeting needs and loving people and preaching the gospel. And we're seeing the city of San Bernardino change. And something like that begin to take place in Corinth, which also had a reputation. Now, their reputation is a little bit different than ours. Their reputation was of having very low morals and sexually perverted. Okay, that's weird. The center of religious life, quote-unquote, Religious life in Corinth was the temple of Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, where the primary means of worship, so what you would do at this temple is you would go and you would pay a prostitute to sleep with them. That was how you worshiped at this temple. And so after leaving Corinth, it seems like Paul recognizes something really incre incredible, that the sexual perversion and the immorality that's been a part of the city's culture and their reputation is kind of creeping into the church, right? And so that's where we see Paul address this in 1 Corinthians, in his first letter to the Corinthians. Now, after he's planted the church, he sends them a letter and says, hey, i got to address something with you, okay? This is one of his first corrections to the church, but I'll, I'll read a, just a little passage of it that I love. It's in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, and I'll read verse 18 as well. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Then in verse 18, he says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. So it gets crazier because in this same letter, this first letter, which we're not diving into fully tonight, just giving the background, he also addresses someone in the church who is living a sexually immoral life. He actually talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He points out that there's rumors of a man who is sleeping with his father's wife or his stepmother. And it's ugly. He says, this is crazy, guys. Not even the pagans do this. You can't have that man in your church. You need to expel him immediately. 
because he's living in sexual sin that will destroy his life and your congregation. So the better part of today's reading is actually after that moment. Now, if you read just 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you might think, well, I don't know what happened to that man. I guess he just got kicked out of the church and that was the end of his story. But that's not the way that godly correction works. See, because today we get to read the other side of this correction. We get to read about a moment in this man's life where the apostle who disciplined him, who brought correction, says, hey, it's time to restore. It's time to bring him back. It's time to affirm our love for him again. And that's something I really want you to remember about godly correction. It always leads to forgiveness, restoration, to love and affection. It never leads to just a punishment, okay? Many times we get the wrong idea about correction. So let's, let's go into this passage, and we're going to dive into correction today a little bit deeper. 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 1 through 11, all right? Now, I'm going to try this a lot to read, so bear with me. But this is Paul again speaking to this church. So I decided that I would not bring you grief with another painful visit. In other words, he's highlighting the fact like, hey, guys, I've had to come and bring correction a few times, and I know that's been painful. How many of you have ever had a painful correction in your life? Okay, just a few of us. How many want to get honest and say you've had a painful correction in your life? <laughs> okay, all of us have probably experienced this at some point. So Paul knows, and he's pointing out, hey, this has been painful. For if I, and, and he goes on to tell them that this is the reason that he wanted to spare them another visit. For if I cause you grief, who will make me glad? Certainly not someone I've grieved. That is why I wrote you as I did, so that when I do come, I won't be grieved by the very ones who ought to give me the greatest joy. Surely you all know that my joy comes from your being joyful. I wrote that letter in great anguish with a troubled heart and many tears. I didn't want to grieve you, but I wanted to let you know how much love I have for you. I love this because Paul's not only pointing out the fact that he knows it was painful for them to receive the correction, but he's also pointing out that it's painful to give correction. And I'm going to jump into that in just a second. Now let's keep reading. Number Verse 5 says, I'm not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble, remember that man I mentioned, he was having an affair with his stepmother. That man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than he hurt me. Most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. Number, uh, verse 9 says, I wrote you as I did to test you and see if you would fully comply with my instructions. When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Man, powerful verse, really a lot to dive into here. I know that's a lot. You can give the word of God a round of applause. It's awesome. It's amazing. So I mentioned we're going to talk about loving correction so tonight, I, I wanted to cover three different things about c correction, three things, three truths that you can love about godly correction. I realized that I had so much in the first two that I'm just going to give you two tonight. But two truths that lo to love about godly correction, we'll see if I get to the third. Truth number one, godly correction is painful. Wait a minute. <laughs> I thought you said you were going to tell us reasons to love correction, Mike. You just said godly correction is painful. Why would I love that? Well, the reality is that there's nothing really to love about pain, but there is something to love about the source of that pain. There is something to love about the results of that pain. So as I mentioned in the first verse, Paul points it out. This is, this, that, that, painful is gonna, that correction is painful. He tells the Corinthians, I know that this has been painful. In verse 4, he says, hey, I, it's been painful for me too. I haven't wanted to correct you, but I had to because I loved you. And he shares that later. Now, I want to share a kind of a crazy story. I was a little bit hesitant to share this story from my life because I don't know how many people have ever experienced something like this. Maybe just a handful. Maybe no one has experienced something like this. But when I was 12 years old, we lived with my grandparents. My mom and my brother are here on the front row. Hey, mom. Hey, bro. And we lived with our grandparents. I was 12 years old, and um, my, my mom wanted to get into my room. And I was 
not happy with the idea that she was going to come to the room. I can't remember why we were beefing or what was going on there, whether I was just being a brat like I often was or whatever was happening. But my mom wanted to get into the room, and when she tried to step into the room, I smashed the door to keep her out, and it actually smashed her finger in the door. Do you remember this, Mom? She didn't know I was going to tell her this story. She started crying. It looked like I might have broken her finger. My grandfather, her dad, was really upset. He said, Michael, go to my room right now and wait for me. I'm going to come in just a minute to give you your punishment. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up in a home that believed in biblical correction. Okay, let me explain what that means that means um, there's this verse in the Bible. It says, spare the rod, spoil the child. And I'm going to just unpack that a little further. It means that in my house, my grandfather would remove his belt. And it would often cross my backside. It's happened on more than one occasion. I'm very unhappy to report. But the idea was that I knew that I was waiting for a whooping. My mom used to say, you're cruising for a bruising. I had already earned the bruising at this point. I was ready for it. And I was sitting on the bed waiting for my grandfather to come in. Now, when I'd last seen him, he was pretty upset. He didn't like the fact that I'd hurt my mom. And, of course, my grandfather, great protector, great father, amazing man of God. Almost never saw him angry, almost never saw him raise his voice, maybe five times in my entire life. And he comes into the room. And when he comes into the room, I'm, I'm feeling pretty nervous. Like, I'm, I'm knowing what's coming, but I got more nervous when I saw his face because he was, like, extremely calm. Have you ever, I mean, it's spanking time, and you're very calm. This is not, this is worrisome. Like, I need to see a little emotion here, Grandpa. I don't know what's going on. I can't read you. And so Grandpa comes in, and he says, Michael, um, you know what you did? I said, yeah, I know what I did. Okay. What do you think that you deserve? What, what do you think should happen here? I said, well, I don't know. I'll probably need to get a spanking. He's like, yeah, I think so. Um, what, how, many, how many swats do you think I should give you? I said, I don't know. I'm, so, I'm, like, I'm aiming for the number that's just enough to appease him, but not enough that I'll actually like, regret it. So I'm like, maybe like five or six. He says, how about three? My grandfather, a very gracious man says three. I said, okay, all right, we can do a deal, right? <laughs> so he said, I, I get up, I, I actually uh, prepare myself for what's coming. And as I stand, my grandfather says, hold on a sec, because I'm going to teach you a lesson about how much God loves us today. I'm going to teach you what it means that Jesus took your punishment and how important that is. And so today, I'm actually going to take your punishment. I said, okay. So here's the belt. You're going to spank me. Now, I know that sounds like a great deal. <laughs> it was not. I loved my grandfather. I respected him. And my immediate response to that was, no way. I am not going to do that. My grandfather, like I said, has only raised his voice maybe two or three times in my entire life. He raised his voice in this moment. He said, you will do it. And so with probably the biggest tears I've ever cried in my life, I gave my grandfather the three swats that I deserved. And I'll never forget that punishment because it literally was the most painful thing I've ever had to do. And it taught me two things. One, it taught me the power of God's grace. How amazing it is that Jesus would take the punishment that we deserve. We did the crime, he did the time. We hurt people, we sinned against them, we sinned against him, and the punishment of that is very clear. The punishment is death, and yet he chose to take that punishment on himself. That blew my mind. I'd learned something about grace that I could not have been taught in any other way. The second thing that blew my mind is how much it cost God the Father to do that. Do you understand how difficult it is to punish someone that does not deserve it? God the Father put his son on a cross for you and for me. His innocent, perfect son who deserved no punishment whatsoever took the punishment that we deserve, the most gruesome death in the history of mankind. He took it all and God is giving him 
the punishment that we deserved. And I couldn't believe how much God loves us, that he would do that for us. You see, God himself experienced pain and correction. That's crazy to think about. Do you imagine how painful it was, the cost to God the Father to see his son dying like that, to be the one that is putting the sins of all mankind upon him and punishing him for us? What a painful, heartbreaking moment. And there's multiple times in the Bible it talks about that. There's another one in Genesis chapter 6 where God looks down on the earth and it says he regrets the sin and the failure and the idolatry and the total lack of reverence that he sees on the earth. It says in this passage that God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth and it grieved him to his heart. Right after that, he makes a decision to bring correction. And I have to I have to point out this word when it talks about grief. It's talking about being heartbroken. God was heartbroken when he had to bring the flood to the earth and destroy mankind for their evil and their wicked ways. God was heartbroken when he had to bring the punishment that we deserve upon his son in that, on that cross 2,000 years ago. So the point of this all is that the pain is real. That correction is painful for both the one who receives it and for the one that is giving it. But there's something important you need to know about that pain. There was a time when you and I felt no pain at all for the people that we were hurting and the grief that we were causing God. But thank God you are no longer like that. Do you remember the days where you went from bar to bar and club to club, where you went from alcoholic beverage to alcoholic beverage or from drug to drug or from strip club to strip club, casino to casino. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I'm just talking about my life. And there's so many times that we can actually become what the Bible says hardened. We lose track of how God feels or what, what it feels like to do wrong. And now as a Christian, we have this pain inside of us when we sin. I, I've talked to so many people that struggling with sin say, I just wish I could get past it and I feel like I'm failing all the time and I feel like I'm never gonna be any better and I don't know how to get past this sin of lust or the sin of, of addiction or the sin of whatever, insert it here. And I, I tell them this, like, do you feel sorrow for this sin in your life? Yeah, I feel horrible. And I'd do anything to not feel that. I said, don't say that. Because that sorrow, that pain that you're feeling is proof that God's spirit is in you. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 8. He says something interesting. He calls the Holy Spirit the helper, the comforter. This is the comfort that the Holy Spirit's going to bring. In verse 8, he says, he, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world about the guilt of sin and the need for a savior and about righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit himself is bringing conviction and the pain for the sins that you've committed. So when you feel this pain inside of you, you should be thanking God because it means his Holy Spirit is there with you. Bringing a pain that maybe you'd never known before. I remember being 18, 19 years old talking to my mom again. At this time, I was not walking with the Lord. I was at a school in Santa Barbara where we spent a lot of time drinking and using drugs. It was the number four party school in the nation at that time. And I had dived right in with all of those people, even though I'd been raised in church, even though I knew that God was real. I wanted to have fun like all my friends. And I remember coming back after maybe a few months, and I can't remember if it was like Christmas break or if it was a summer break that year, but I came back to my mom and I said, Mom, you got to stop praying for me. <laughs> Dumb idea. I said, Mom, would you please just stop praying for me? Because I'm looking around and I'm seeing all my friends having just the time of their lives at the strip club. They're enjoying the bar so much. They love to rail those lines of coke. They're all over the women and the there's so much fun in these parties, but I feel miserable. I'm 
I'm not get, I kept thinking, I must not be doing this right. They look really happy. I am miserable. I guess I've got to drink less. I've got to drink more. I've got to smoke less. I've got to smoke more. I've got to be monogamous. I've got to be polygamous. I don't know. I don't know how to do this so that I can have as much fun as these people seem to be having. But you see, something was different about me. I'd been raised in a godly home. I'd been taught the value of God's word. I knew that God was real. I knew there was a Holy Spirit. I'd been baptized as a little boy in the Holy Spirit. I knew God's spirit was real and he would not allow me to enjoy things the way that those around me were. Remember Paul's long list of things in 1 Corinthians, right? He talks about the sexually immoral, the idolaters, the the adulterers, the prostitutes, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, people that abuse people. He gives this long list of those sinners. And I have to know, I have to believe, and I, I really know this is to be true from experiencing this, that there was pain in their lives, right? The pain of consequences. The pain of the morning after. How many of you have ever experienced the morning after? You get up, you're like, what happened? You're texting and calling your friends just trying to figure out what took place between the hours of midnight and 2 a.m.? Because I can't remember. Nobody else is like that? Okay, just a few of us. All right. Yeah. We're lost. We wake up. There's pain. But it's not the right kind of pain. This is the pain of worldly sorrow. This is the pain of depression. It's the pain of despair. But it's not the kind of pain that matters. It's not the kind of pain that results in change. It's just the kind of pain that makes you negotiate. Maybe I should do this differently. Maybe I should promise myself I won't smoke a bowl in the evenings. I'll only smoke it in the mornings. I don't know. But I got to figure out something new. And you're not actually going to change because the pain you're experiencing is simply the pain of your choices. It's the pain of consequences in your life. But it's not the pain of conviction, because the pain of conviction, the pain of correction will change your life forever, and it leads to something you've been longing for. I love the story in the New Testament of when God sends the Holy Spirit on the New Testament church. The apostle Peter and all the disciples are waiting in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit comes down, and Peter gets up and preaches the sermon of his life. He starts to describe who Jesus is. He tells the people that are listening. They're Jews, by the way. Some of them probably stood in the place where they condemned Jesus and cried out, crucify him. And so he says to these same people, you killed the Messiah. You did it. You rejected him even though he came to demonstrate his love for you, his kindness, and to pay the price for you. You rejected him. And when Peter says that, something crazy happens. Acts 2.37 describes the moment these men hear the truth of who Jesus is for the first time. And it says this, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? That Greek word, the word cut there is a Greek word, and I'm hoping I can pronounce this correctly. It's katanousamai. Wow, what a word. It means to prick, to pierce, to metaphorically pain the mind, sharply agitate it vehemently. These guys are sitting there listening to Peter, and while they're listening, this pain is unfolding in their life. They're feeling horrible. They're feeling guilt. They're feeling shame. There's a pain inside of them. They're saying, I'm, I feel like you're cutting my heart open. I feel like you're breaking me inside. But it does something so beautiful because the results are they fall to their knees and they say, what must we do to be saved? How can, I, how can I move from this point of pain to the point that you're talking about where Jesus pays for my sins? So there was a time when those men felt no pain at all for their sins and failures. But there came a day when the way, the truth, and the life was made known to them. And there was great pain on that day. But it was pain that led them to salvation. I love the way that Paul concludes 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm talking about correction here, guys. I'm talking about something that's painful. I'm talking about something that most of us try to reject and avoid at all costs. But I'm telling you that there's something beautiful and loving about correction that you must receive in your life if you want to experience the fullness of what God has. See, at the end of lo that laundry list of sins and sinners that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 6, he says something at the end. 
He says something at the end that's very important. He talks about all the things that you have been, all the adultery and the idolatry and the, the drunkard, the drunkenness and the drug use and the cheating and the abusing of people. He says that's, that's all been a part of your past. See, something took place inside of you when you met Jesus, when the pain of conviction came into your heart and you said, I can't go to the temple of Aphrodite anymore. I can't go to that prostitute anymore. I can't go to that casino anymore. It just doesn't have any joy for me. There's something not right about the way I feel when I walk in those doors. I don't feel joy. I don't feel satisfaction. I feel pain. And when you feel that pain, Paul says that is the beginning of something amazing happening. It's the moment you're about to be redeemed. See, that is what some of you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Thank God for the pain of conviction. Thank God for the pain of correction, for it leads us to repentance and salvation. Some of you have been suffering. You've been going through a painful season. You've been saying, God, when is this going to end? Why is this going on? You know how hard this is. And God is saying, I'm taking you someplace that you've longed to be. Don't reject the correction. Receive it. Embrace it. Because the results are amazing. Look at Hebrews 12, 11. It says it so plainly. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Man, you know, the Apostle Paul was on the receiving end of some severe correction himself. Think about this guy. So Paul, those of you who don't know, he is educated by one of the greatest rabbis of his time. He's a part of the upper upper, upper echelon of the most educated men in the world. He's a part of a group that rules over most of the Jewish population called the Sanhedrin. He actually becomes one of their chief, like, I don't know how to describe it. It's the word would be magistrate, but someone who actually goes and enforces Jewish law all over the place. And so he gets to travel and be respected. And people, when they say, oh, that's Paul, that's Paul. He was trained by Gamaliel. He's one of the Pharisees, he's a Sanhedrin, and there's this, this life that Paul is leading that I think most people around him would have thought was pretty good. Man, what respect he commands, what popularity he enjoys, and even Paul himself talks about this later in the book of Philippians, but the idea is that Paul has a life that's pretty well put together, and he's on his way to Damascus to do his job, which happens to be persecuting Christians killing them and enslaving them, putting them into prison. And so he's on his way and he meets a point of correction. The Bible says that in Acts chapter 9, Saul, his name was Saul back then, meets Jesus and Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And this is a crazy moment of correction in Paul's life because all of this good stuff is happening and all of a sudden Paul meets God and he doesn't even know who he is. He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, who you have been persecuting. And in this moment, the Bible's clear that Paul actually suffers something pretty traumatic. He actually goes blind. The light that he sees and the voice that he hears blinds him. He sees Jesus. He can't even guide himself anywhere. It says the men with him took him by the hand like a child and led him to Damascus. This man who would walk with such pomp and circumstance and pride, walk into Damascus and say, I'm here, is now being led like a child into the very same city in blindness, in pain. But guess what, guys? If that moment of correction and pain doesn't take place in Paul's life, we don't have the book of 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. We don't have the letters that Paul has written. We don't get to experience some of the incredible truth of who God is that comes from Paul's pen. We don't get to learn and have our lives affected by this man's life because he'd just go to his grave as a Pharisee instead of as an apostle sent by Jesus with the truth that correction can change everything for you. Let me share another story. I've shared it before. 2017, I was uh, serving in a church for 10 years in San Francisco. 
I really enjoyed my life. I was traveling to preach the gospel on mission trips uh, at least once or twice a year. I was serving in a few different ministries at that church. I was, I was actually there in, in, ser- in service with my sister. There's a lot of good things that were happening. And God uh, looked down and said, there's got to be more. Like, I thought that I had arrived. Literally, there's this moment just a, w- a few weeks before this correction takes place in my life where I'm saying to myself, I'm just going to stay here. This is good. I'm good here. And God says, no, Mike, there's more. There's more. There's more. And and, and I'm glad he did that because, you know, one thing I would have been lacking if I'd stay there, my beautiful wife who's sitting on the front row right here. God saw a plan for my life that was far greater than what I could imagine at that moment, and so he brought some correction. How did that look? I lost my job. I was fired from the church that I was serving at. I was told, don't ever come back to our church. I lost the church I was at. I actually lived at the church, so I lost my home. I lost most of my friends and family, and I was feeling pretty bad. I wasn't enjoying my life at that moment. I wrote to a friend. I said, man, you can't believe all the things that are happening. He said, you're getting promoted. I said, you don't understand the story. I'm in a lot of pain here. What was he saying? You're in the pain of correction, Mike. God's taking you to a place that you've longed to be. You're about to go to the place that you've been destined to go if you'll just receive this correction and walk it through. Now, I wish I would walked that through better, but I, I can say that my life is better because of godly correction. And your life will be better, too, if you'd only receive it. So let's go to this last point. This is the last point of the night. God's correction, godly correction demonstrates his love. So the pain that God brings in correction is for a purpose that takes us to the place that we need to be. But but godly correction is also one of the primary ways that God shows us his love. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, I didn't want to grieve you, but I wanted to let you know how much I love I have for you. Interesting. Paul's telling them, I had to correct you because I love you so much. There's nothing more difficult in ministry than having to bring correction. There's very little in ministry that causes a leader more grief than having to correct a wandering sheep. In my own life, I've, I've definitely, as a, as a pastor, as a leader at our church and with my own disciples and such, there's times where I recognize like, oh, there's something that needs to be corrected here. Something needs to change. You know, there's, maybe it's an impatience issue. Maybe it's an anger issue. Maybe it's a pornography issue. Maybe it's an adultery issue. Maybe it's something really serious. Maybe it's something that they're completely blind to. And I recognize, oh man, God's telling me so that I can help them, so that I can correct them. And, and I'll be honest with you, like my, my first instinct, which we'll call the flesh, is to say, nah, Pastor Armando can have that. <laughs> Just let him take care of that problem because that's way above my pay grade. I don't want to deal with that. Why? Because I want to be liked. I don't want to go into a room and sit across from you and tell you, hey, you've been messed up. You're really, you're really not doing what you're supposed to be doing. No one wants to hear that. They're not going to like me after that moment. They're going to think I'm a jerk. And I don't want to do that moment, but something compels me to do it anyway. Something compels me. It's it's called love. Because I love them so much, I don't care how much they like me. I love them so much that I will not allow them to stay stuck in that sin or that failure or that mistake. I have to tell them so that they can get better. It'd be like seeing someone with cancer and saying, well, hope that works out when you have the cure in your hand. And so godly correction actually is driven by love. I'll skip that story because it's kind of a funny one. But Hebrews 12, 6 says it this way. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Wow. He disciplines those he loves. Revelation 3, 19 says, I correct and discipline everyone I love. Love. Say it with me. Love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, as I get, I'm just going to close with this. Got a few minutes here. I'm going to tell you one story and we're going to conclude. I was um, about a year into full-time ministry. It was 2009. And uh, we were in the Easter season, which is a very busy season at church. And I know I don't need to tell most of you because you're all volunteers at the way and you guys work like 90 hours a week on Easter, right? So we were working a lot. We were getting a lot done. There was a lot to be accomplished. We're inviting people. We're hitting the streets. We're getting the services ready. We're preparing a musical. So there was just all kinds of stuff happening. Kind of right around that same season as we're getting ready for this big musical on Easter, I got the news that my dad had died. 
And I know some of you heard my story. I've shared it before that my dad died a, a really surprising, horrible death. He had been a minister and a, a great father up until I was about 11 years old when he divorced my mom and left our family for another woman and started a life of promiscuity, drugs, alcohol. And my dad died of an overdose at 59 years old, all alone in the middle of nowhere. And so I got news that my dad had died, and it was crazy because I'd been praying for God to save him. And so I, I was thinking about, like, why didn't God answer my prayer? And I was thinking about all the, the feelings that come from losing someone that, that's, that's that important in your life. And it doesn't matter if you've had a great relationship with your dad or if you've had a horrible relationship. Losing that person is really important. And so I was doing a really bad job of processing my emotions. I was feeling overlooked. I was feeling like I was forgotten. I was feeling like I was hurt. I was feeling like God ignored my prayers. And now we're getting really busy. And it's crazy because just a year before that, when I'd started the ministry, I was like so excited. I was like a kid in the candy store. Like, this is great. They're inviting me to come work at the church. I can't believe it. I can't wait. I'm going to make phone calls. It didn't matter. I didn't care what they were going to give me. My first job at the church was to click forward on the worship lyric slides. Like, forward, forward, forward. And I loved it. It was the best job I'd ever had. I loved, loved, loved being able to serve the church. When they invited me to come on full time, I was so excited. But here I am about a year later, I'm going through the loss of my dad, and I'm really, really busy. I'm doing a lot more than just clicking forward on a worship slide, but... Inside of me is this turmoil. Inside of me is this anger and this frustration, this feeling like I have been forgotten. And I can remember, sent, actually, I was on a, a scaffold with one of our volunteers. Now, I mentioned that because I'm on staff, he's a volunteer, and I'm up there complaining. This is stupid. I can't believe they have us doing these three-hour rehearsals. This is crazy. That Saturday, I was going through it. I was still very, very tired and, and frustrated. And our pastor called because they had dropped off this gigantic inflatable. You guys ever seen those inflatables we do here at our church sometimes? These big things that blow up and the kids jump on them and have a great time. This thing must have weighed like a ton. They dropped it off the Saturday before because we are going to have it for Easter. It was in the back parking lot. And our pastor called and said, hey, you got to get that into the church because I don't want anybody to steal it. Now... I was tired. I went out to the parking lot like this. Who is going to steal a one-ton inflatable? It takes 10 people to move this thing. You don't even have a, they, they, they need a semi to get this out of here. Who is going to steal this thing? That's how I'm talking. And just grumbling, complaining, murmuring, whining over and over and over again. So the next morning comes, we did actually get that inflatable inside. Praise God. <laughs> no thanks to me. I, I was basically just complaining. <clears throat> the next day comes 6 o'clock. We're at our Sunday morning staff meeting. We're going to get ready to go and do this big ministry. It, and it's like, I don't know if you guys know this, but like for churches, this is like a big day. Like this is a day where we get to celebrate what Jesus did and we get to see him touch more lives than we ever touched before. Like more people are going to come through the door than ever before on this Sunday, right? And so there's like a level of excitement, there's anticipation. We walk in, I'm, I'm sitting down with our staff, there's only about six of us, and the pastor says, guys, I was praying last night and God told me that he will not bless our efforts today because there's rebellion in the camp and I have to fire all of you. It was a hard day. It was a, a very difficult moment. It was a painful moment. Everybody in the circle began to cry. I began to cry. They each made apologies. And when it came to my turn, I turned to my pastor and I said, Pastor, this is on me. And he said, yes, it is. You see, I knew that I'd blown it, that I'd let my heart get way off track. We had to go through the rest of that Sunday, not as staff members, but as volunteers. He said, hey, look, the Lord's only told me that I can't have you on staff. If you guys will serve in some volunteer capacity today, that would be fine. We'll have to talk later this week about what this is going to look like going forward. It was a very difficult day. It was a very painful day. It was a very <laughs> long day. 
And I remember just about a day or two later when the dust had settled and we started to talk about how to move forward, I recognized something really incredible about God. Now, obviously, thank, thank the Lord, they did hire me back. <laughs> but there was something really neat and amazing that God taught me in that moment. And it was this, that God was not content that that ministry would go forward without me. I'm, I'm explain that. This is the, the culmination of 15 or 20 years of ministry. Like, this is going to be the biggest day in the history of the last 20 years of the church. And God said, no, that's not more important than Mike. My pastor's been pouring his life out for 15 years in this mission field. He's been working. All the kids have been working. All the volunteers have been working. They've all been working for this big day. And God said, that's not more important than Mike. You understand that God was saying something really profound to me. He's like, Mike, I love you more than all this other stuff that really is important, that really does matter, all the souls that are going to get saved, all the people that are going to come and hear the gospel, all the things that are going to be celebrated today, those are all important, but they're not more important than you. I will not let this go forward while you are jacked up inside. And that is the heart of God for every one of us in this room. He's not content to allow all this good stuff to be happening all around you while you're still jacked up. He will not allow it. And so he brings correction. He says, hey, you're on the wrong track. You're headed towards destruction. Mike, you loved the ministry a year ago and now you hate it. Now all you do is complain. I have to help you get your heart right. Today you're fired. I'm bringing correction so that I can take you to a place that you need to be. What am I saying? I'm saying don't reject the pain of correction. Welcome it. Another one, this is free. Don't ever ask your mom to stop praying for you. <laughs> but instead, choose to embrace the fact that you have a destiny that is different than the people around you. Don't get angry at, the God, for, at God for the season you're in. Recognize that he's taking you to more. See, in the middle of this painful season you might be in, and I know there's some people in this room right now, you're in a painful season. And I don't, I don't know, maybe some of you are suffering the pain of consequences, and you know I need to repent, I need to change. There's some things in my life that I brought on myself, but some of you might be like I was at different points in my life, and you recognize, you know what, this is just, this is the pain of correction. This is God moving me to someplace I didn't, I didn't see before. I didn't know at the end of 2017 that God was going to take me to the greatest church I'd ever seen in my life, the Wayworld Outreach. I didn't know that he was going to make me a part of this family. I didn't know that he was going to bring me to this woman. I didn't know that he was going to get, I was going to get to travel the world with some of the most wonderful volunteers and servants I've ever met in my life to preach the gospel. But God did, and he was correcting me. And some of you might be going through a season of correction. You've been, I don't even know how I got here, but God does. God does. He's taking you someplace. So I want us to learn to love correction. Proverbs 10, 17 says, accept correction and you will find life. Reject correction and you will miss the road. And so today, this is the final call. It's for anybody in here that's saying, you know what, I recognize that there's some pain in my life that I've maybe brought on myself, that I've I've been wrong thinking. I've been acting like a fool. I've been murmuring, complaining like Mike was. I haven't been grateful. I've allowed my heart to get messed up and jacked up, and I just need a correction. I need to get my heart right. Maybe there's some people in here that, you know, hey, this is your first time in the church, or you been, haven't been here in a while, and you know, no, I'm actually just, I'm dealing with all the consequences of those sins. Those mornings after are getting kind of tiring. I'm tired of trying to be somebody I'm not. I'm tired of trying to be like the world and negotiate how much I'm going to drink or smoke or chew, and I got to stop. Maybe that's you tonight. Or maybe you're just somebody that is going through a season of correction, and you didn't, you didn't see it coming. You didn't know why. You don't even know why right now, but you want to believe that God is taking you to more. You want to challenge yourself to believe in faith that this is actually taking you someplace that you've longed to be. And all those things, there's one way to get to the other side. It's through Jesus. So we're going to invite our, worship, our, our altar team to come. And they're going to come to the front right now. And, and I'm making this call to, to any of those people. 
Maybe you're somebody that's just saying, I just need Jesus. I've been trying to do it wrong. I've been telling my mom, stop praying for me. I've been trying to negotiate on how much I do and how much I don't. And I realize that I can't do that. I can't play this game anymore. I need to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come in just a moment. If you're somebody who's going through a season of consequences, you know Jesus. You've, you've given your life to him, but there's compromise in your life, like the compromise that Paul was addressing. There's things that you know that they don't belong. They're not supposed to be here. I don't want this in my life anymore. Tonight is your night to surrender it, to give it up and say, I'm done with that old way of life. I'm going to live for Jesus. And the last group is, again, those people that are saying, I'm going through a season, Mike. You, you spoke to me tonight, that pain that I've been in. I didn't recognize what it was, but now I know it's God taking me to someplace I long to be. And I want to stand in faith tonight. If that's you, if you fit any of those categories, I want you to stand to your feet. Any of those categories. I'm here. I need, digi- I need Jesus. I love it. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. I want to surrender. I'm in a season of pain, of, of correction. Come on. Don't delay. Just stand up. Just stand up. Go ahead and give them a hand as they come. You guys walk down. Those of you just stood up. Come on down. Come on down. Come on now. Let's give them some, give them some encouragement, y'all. This is a big day. You don't know what they've been walking through. You don't know what they've been going through. Give them some encouragement. Let's celebrate some people coming to Jesus tonight, saying, I'm done with the old way. I'm ready for the new season. I'm ready for the new thing that God has for me. All right. Awesome. Let's all stand to our feet in this place. Everybody stand up. We got a few people that we're going to pray with right now. Guys, if you're here at the front, we're going to pray a prayer of surrender. It doesn't matter if you're going through this season, you already know Jesus, or if you're just now new coming to Jesus, the key here is surrender. Just say, I accept the, re- the correction. I'm ready for this season. Thank you, God, for where you've brought me, and I'm ready for my next step. I'm ready for the next thing that you're taking me to. So let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, I surrender. Thank you for your correction. Thank you, Holy Spirit for convicting me, for bringing pain to my life so that I can be changed, so that I can be saved, so that I can be different, so that I can fulfill my purpose and my destiny. I give you my life. I trust you with all that I am. I surrender. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Give it up for these guys one more time. A round of applause for every single person that came forward tonight. Thank you guys. Do you want to close this out, bro? Guys, can we give God praise for that awesome word? Can we give Mike a hand? What a powerful word. That's not an easy word to deliver. Someone say, ouch. I needed that. Thank you so much. Um, We love you, church. We will see you guys on Sunday. It's going to be a powerful. We're going to continue our series in spiritual warfare. We are in spiritual warfare right now, and we're going to come together this Sunday. We love you. If you're a young adult, I want to see you this Friday night at 7 p.m. I'm going to be bringing a message this Friday night at 7 o'clock to all the young adults. It's going to be powerful. If you need prayer, come forward. We have a whole team up here. We'd love to pray with you. Come forward, and we want to make sure we take care of and we pray with you. God bless you. Remember, if God is for you, there's no one who can come against you. God bless.